Thank you for listening to the North Star Narrative, a podcast by North Star Academy. I hope you're encouraged, challenged, and motivated by what you learned today. Enjoy the story. Welcome to the North Star Narrative. We're on the road today in Starkville, Mississippi. We are on the campus of Mississippi State University, and we are so excited to have Mrs. Laura Dunn here with us today. She is the director of the Student Success Center on the campus. She graduated from Mississippi State in 2008, earning her bachelor's degree in communication with an emphasis in public relations. She then went on to get her master's in counselor education with an emphasis in student affairs. She is also getting her PhD right now and soon will be Dr. Laura Dunn. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm happy to be here today. Some fun facts about her. I learned that she doesn't really like spaghetti. Nope, don't like red sauce. Is there a story behind that? Ever since I was a small child, I hated cooked tomatoes. I like ketchup. I like raw tomatoes. Cooked tomatoes, don't like them. Yeah, never, never have. She also has a little story behind Frozen 2. Do you want to talk about that, or should I let it go? Um, I am one of those divisive individuals. There are certain topics that, that people love, and then there's always this, this random person, the, the descent of the crowd. I hate Frozen 2. I think it is nothing like Frozen 1. <laughs> um, I love Frozen 1 because it is fun. It's enjoyable. The songs are catchy. I took my three-year-old to Frozen 2, and I think she was bored out of her mind the whole time. It was too serious. Good movie, but not the best audience. In my perspective, and I I know my perspective is not everybody's, and I'm okay with that. (laughs) I have not seen it yet, but I'll I'll take your advice. Okay, tell us a little bit about your family. Um, So my family, so I've been married for 11 years. Um, I married my kind of college sweetheart. My husband, George Dunn, and I were very involved on campus together, and we got married um, we have three small children. I have a, a 10-year-old George, who's a fifth grader. I have a, an eight-year-old Jude, who's a second grader, as well as I have a three-year-old little girl. Awesome. So tell us your story about why you came to Mississippi State. Then you left for a little while, and now you are back here. Yeah, so I didn't actually originally grow up in the South. I actually grew up in central Pennsylvania. My father was a faculty member at Penn State. So so higher ed has always been something I've been very familiar with my whole life. Um, but when I was in junior high, my family decided to move to Mississippi. My, my parents were originally from the South, Mississippi. Um, and so it made sense for us to be closer to grandparents as, as they were getting older. And so when I was looking at schools, I looked at schools all over the country. But what it ultimately came down to is I had to have a heart to heart with my parents. Really, my my parents had to have a heart to heart with me about the the realities of going to college. Uh, One of the biggest things being finances. And my dad actually worked for Mississippi State through extension. And so if I attended Mississippi State, I personally got half off of tuition. And so that was kind of the smart move. I also knew I was probably going to go to grad school in something. And so it made sense, heck, save the money, go to a good public institution in my state. And again, that was my choice. And I know that's not the choice for everybody, but for me, that made sense to, to come to Mississippi State. And so I came here in the fall of 2004. Um, I'm one of the very unique students that I never changed my major, and I actually graduated in four wow. years. Uh, my parents did not expect that. Um, of, I have, I have, I'm one of three children, and they thought if there was one child that was going to change her major five times and extend out her career, it would have been me. Um, and But I didn't, amazingly. Uh, But like she said, I I did get my undergraduate degree in public relations, and that was what I originally intended to do. But when I got into college, um, I'm not going to say I didn't invest in my academics. I 100% did. But where I saw myself really bloom was was the outside of the classroom experiences. I was an incredibly involved student on campus. Um, I had a lot of obstacles inside of higher education. Um, I'm an individual that I was always a decent student growing up, but I had some 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 disabilities and some problems. I have a, a type of dyslexia called dysgraphia, and so writing was something that was difficult for me. Being a communication major, there's an enormous amount of writing you have to do, and so I leaned on a lot of resources at our university to help me. Um, letting students know that you have to lean on those resources was something that, that I learned and I pushed people toward continually. And that, that undergraduate degree and those connections I created, the involvement that I had, is what kind of drove me toward my next step. And once I graduated, yeah, I got a job um, in New Orleans in a job market that was PR related. Um, and a couple years after that, I realized I want to be back inside of higher education. I want to give back to the institution that gave so much to me. Wow. As you can tell, she's got lots of knowledge and passion. 
She is super passionate about students and sharing with them and helping them stay the course. So what does the Student Success Center at Mississippi State offer students? Okay, so so our center, um, we are still fairly new. Um, like Stephanie said, I helped found this center. That was only five years ago when we originally started. And I'm not going to say that we weren't helping students before. We have, we're, we're, we're a large Research One university. We have over 22,000 students. And so we have plenty of resources that are helping students, but they were really helping pockets of students. And what we realized is that, heck, we have students that, that don't fit into these pockets that end up needing help. And so we said, what, what if we were to create a center, we were to actively watch our freshman class specifically because um, we target freshmen because they are the most vulnerable population at the university. That, that transition from your high school years, living with your family to all of a sudden coming to a university is, is a difficult transition for anybody. And every single student experiences that differently. And so we started a program called the Freshman Year Navigators. And Freshman Year Navigators are a peer mentoring program. And with that peer mentoring program, every single freshman has one of those navigators. In fact, if you're a student coming to Mississippi State um, a few days before the semester starts, you get your first contact from your navigator. And that person that's assigned to you on the first day will stay with you your entire freshman year. They send you at minimum a weekly email letting you know, what's going on at the university this week whether it's hey advising time is coming up have you talked to your advisor yet did you know there's a basketball game this weekend there's this cool event happening on the drill field a general email but also we're reaching out to students through text messages through phone calls there's there's not a time that i don't walk across our drill field on campus and i don't see one of my navigators sitting down and, and having a conversation with a student as well so we are meeting with students on a regular basis one-on-one -on -one for sure and so the navigators are a huge part of our center. Uh, besides just the navigators, our center actually, we're, we're more than just one little building. We encompass all the first year experience courses on class on, on campus. So items like our True Maroon course, which are our first year experience courses, kind of a, a how-to college. Um, we have um, a college ready program, which is a, a program where students can come to school a, you know, a, a month early. So instead of coming in August, you can come in in July, take one or two courses, get a good kind of intro to our university um, and get comfortable and then start school back in, the, in August as well. And so we have um, that program. We have, uh, we work with the Learning Center. It's, it's involved in our umbrella, which is our academic hub of help on campus. So all of our tutoring, we have tutors for over a hundred different classes on campus. And let's say you look at that list and you say, man, that random class that I'm in that is completely over my head is not on that list. Um, you can 100% go to the Learning Center request for a tutor that's a free service they'll find you a tutor no problem we also are the the only school in the state of mississippi that has a um that has a supplemental instruction program that is um, that's certified and supplemental instruction is a new type of tutoring offered at our university and across the country that is very specific to not just your your course but your teacher as well and so um, we have SI in over 55 different courses this semester, and we are really, really excited about that. Um, additionally, uh, we almost act as academic tutors inside of our office. I, I have meetings. I meet with students basically all day in my office trying to intervene and say, how can we fix your problems? When I see students that have a lot of absences or, or, or potentially bad grades, bad progress grades, to, to me, those aren't necessarily the big problems. Granted, they're, they are problems. But they're a symptom of something else. If we have bad grades, if we have high absences, my job is to figure out why that is the case. And I try to make sure I can intervene, figure out what is that root cause, and, and we work from there. Uh, we have a, a large data system that we work with that about 95% of, of absences and about 90% of progress grades um, are updated on a regular basis. And so um, my center can see those. A lot of advisors can see those across campus. Uh, we have a parent portal as well at our university. So parents can log in and see, is my child going to class? Is my child, what do their grades generally look like? It's not quite as intense as, as a high school where you can see every single thing, but, but you can see those progress grades and they pull in. And they usually pull in after every test. Wow, so you can see that Mississippi State really cares about their students to have this program. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about, speak to parents first. What would you say to parents if their kids maybe are in ninth, 10th, or even getting ready for high school along those years? What should a parent be doing to prepare their student for yeah, college? Absolutely. So um, one thing is, is making sure that your child is responsible it is a big thing because all of a sudden think about when they come to college, you will not be waking them up every day. You will not be making sure, did you do your homework? Have you done your readings? Um, you know you have a club meeting tonight. You've got an intramural game tonight. 
no one's going to be telling you that. And so what I encourage parents to do is when your kids are younger, start letting them make their own schedules, M make them come up with their schedules, have them have a planner, ha do time management, make sure they are taking care of themselves a good bit. Cause, cause we see that the independence is one of the biggest problems that students have on our campus. That if, if parents are, are too, overboard with watching exactly what their child does and making sure they plan every single every single thing for them that can be problematic when they come to campus all of a sudden and and they don't know how to do anything we, we have students sometimes that come to our campus and say oh I, I've never done my own laundry before I don't know how to do that wait wait I don't I don't know how to cook I don't know how to make a grilled cheese sandwich we've never had a grilled cheese sandwich when you were in like the 10th grade no I've never I wasn't allowed to touch the stove like those little bitty things give your child some some independence um let them fail sometimes I that's a valuable lesson that you know we'll have students come to our university and the first time they've ever messed up was their freshman year they've never made an even remotely bad grade before and all of a sudden oh gosh, you know, they have a meltdown. And so let your children occasionally fail at something. That's okay. That is part of growth. Um, making sure you, you teach your students that if you are having problems, ask for help. So if you find that your, your child's not being challenged, give them something that will challenge them. And that doesn't have to always be academic. You know, take them to an, an experience of some sort, uh, something that they're not familiar with. Um, challenge them to, to think critically um, and, and let them understand, hey, if you don't understand something, ask me. Ask for help. Um, we'll find out, find out things. Um, push your students outside of their comfort zone. As, as crazy as that sounds, again, as parents, and like I said, I have three small children, so I understand the idea of trying to keep my children safe and comfortable but some of those experiences that your children have that pushes them outside of their comfort zone, are they going to be able to, to work with people that are completely different than them? How are they going to feel if all of a sudden they have a teacher that they don't get along with? Uh, I'll have students come to me and say, oh, my gosh, I, I don't like this one teacher. Well, you're going to have a boss you don't like one day. You're, you're going to have a coworker you don't want like one day. you got to deal with that. And so, again, can students deal with difficult situations? How do they overcome that? Um, basically trying to treat – Teenagers like adults before they come to college is, is really important. I love that. My uh, husband is always saying, I want my kids to have an opportunity to make mistakes while they're at home. And also, a quote that I heard recently, no growth happens unless you're on the edge of your comfort zone. Oh, true. So I love that. And um, my daughters don't like me pushing them. But it's fun to push somebody off the edge and just see because you see – light bulbs come on and the growth and just so much more than um, if they just stay comfortable. So that is really, really good advice. So what about for students? What would you say to students that are starting to look at colleges and just have no idea? They may be fearful. How do you start? Okay, well, first, uh, if you want to come to Mississippi State, I'll give you a tour. Come on, come on. I'll take you. Uh, but, but honestly, when you're looking at colleges, you, you first need to figure out what kind of college do you want to go to. And and that's a difficult question to ask yourself if you're 16 years old. Um, but, but think about, do you want to be at, at a large school? Do you want to be at a small school? Um, and know that it doesn't really matter what kind of college you go to. The more you put into that experience, the more you're going to get back. And so, um, you know, th there are probably students that would assume going to a big school, you'll be one in a crowd. Um, I never had that experience here, for instance. And I've had friends that have been to other large schools and if you dig yourself into somewhere, if, if you get involved, if you, if you get to know your teachers and your administrators, you can have kind of a small school inside of a big school. But, but figure out what kind of academic program are you looking for? Are, are you looking for something very, very specific that only a few schools have? Are you looking for something a little more general as well? Um, I do think money is a big part of that. I, I tell students, make sure that you tour schools. There are um, you know, when I was in my when I was in my student affairs program, um, I had a May semester course we had to take where we we went around to eight different schools during a May semester because I, I had a full time job, but everybody else in my graduate program they didn't have a job. They would be job searching once we graduated, and so we went to large publics, we went to small privates, we went to religious institutions, we went to uh, very liberal institutions. It, it was a little bit of a mix of everything. And it was so interesting to me, some of the schools that I thought, hey, I'm going to really like this school, and I had these ideas in my head of what schools would be like, I would step foot on a campus, I would meet students, I would talk to administrators, and that would change my perspective. And so I really encourage students, 
don't just look at brochures. That's a great place to start. But if you if you have the ability, actually talk to people. Go visit a campus on a regular day. Going to a football game does not count as a campus visit. Um, that is not what a college experience is like. That's one day. Um, that is not a typical day. And so I really encourage people to, to actually research what kind of schools there are. Um, we, we do have the Internet now, and that's a pretty wonderful resource. And so look around, see what, what kind of opportunities do schools have, what kind of programs do they have. Figure out if, if there are certain kind of activities you want to be involved in or, again, certain kind of experiences you want to have. Um, make sure you look at those schools, but um, keep, your, keep an open mind. Yeah. Great advice. Um, what programs specifically do you have to help students get ahead on adjusting to the independence that comes with being away from home? Okay, so um, specific programs when it comes to the adjusting. So like I said, we do have the Navigator program, which is really good. Um, navigators are sitting down with students one-on-one, -on -one figuring out, okay, what is the problem you're having? Uh, very individualized, and, and how do we overcome that? Um, the amount of resources we have on campus is absolutely amazing. Um, Tell us about the Navigator. Who is a Navigator? How do you become a Navigator? Okay, yeah, our Navigators, um, we have a, a pretty large group of these students. They're upperclassmen, either sophomores, juniors, or seniors. Um, those Navigators go through a, a very difficult process of being recruited for that program. Uh, they have a very long interview process. They are all phenomenal students, but all of them have also been through a couple struggles themselves, and I think that makes them a really good candidate because it's – um, if you've ever struggled with something and the person helping you is picture perfect and they've never really had those kind of struggles, it's a little frustrating. And so we make sure that all of our navigators have some kind of story that they were able to overcome something. And so we'll have navigators that maybe their first semester in college was actually a really bad semester. They, they didn't go to class. They got bad grades. They, they made a lot of bad choices. But let's be honest, when you are 18 years old, that is about the perfect time in your life to make a dumb decision. But it's, it's not that dumb choice that defines you. It's what you do in response to that. And so the navigators that we hire that started off in that situation, they change their behavior. And all of a sudden now, three semesters in a row, they've, they've gotten over a 3.5 GPA. They have completely turned around who they are. That, that, that show of resiliency is a perfect mark of someone that would be a really good navigator. Um, but, but also it's not just academic struggles we've had. We have students that came from a, across the country or across the world. Um, I, I try to make sure that my group of students, um, I have one of the most diverse groups of students you can have. Um, and when I say that, I don't just mean I have, I have white students and black students, though I do. Um, but, but I look for people that have different backgrounds in general, different, different majors, different socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, I always have a couple people that are, that are different religions as well because I understand that not everybody at my university is a Christian. I also have, you know, one or two international students every single year as well because that's a population on our campus as well. Um, we have students that um, started off and didn't know a soul at our university and felt lonely, but again, they dug their heels and they got involved and, and now they love this place. Um, I, have, I have other students that maybe on the outside look perfect and they have great grades and everything looked good, but, but you find out they had a serious uh, a family member that passed away their freshman year that had a major impact on them and they struggled with that as well. And so um, it, it's a wonderful group of students as well that, that are working with freshmen on a daily basis, um, keeping them up to, to high standards. Um, our goal, um, some people will say in student success, our goal is just retention. So how many freshmen come back sophomore year? And that's part of my measure in my office. But I'm not just concerned about retention, how many. I, I'm really concerned about growth. And so if we find a freshman that's having a problem, how do we – get them to the level of making sure they're meeting their greatest potential, uh, bringing them up a notch, and all of a sudden that freshman became an even better freshman they would have been. They become an even better sophomore, better junior. They take advantage of more opportunities. They graduate sooner. They get better job opportunities after graduation. It, it's, it's really about growth. Now, Laura, you were telling me about a student who um, the parent was worried about them, and the parent called. So tell us a little bit about how parents can contact you if they're worried about their freshmen. And tell us a little bit about this story, how you intervened. So I have a lot of those stories, uh, to be honest with you. So who knows which one it was, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, but I have parents that call me. I, I probably have, have four phone calls that I've missed since I've been here, to be honest with you, in my office. Um, I, for instance, I speak at orientation sessions. I speak at preview days. And I, I give my cell phone, uh, which is crazy. Uh, but I've had the same cell phone number since I was in the seventh grade. I have it on me all the time, and I'm, I'm always walking around campus, so I tell students, hey, if you have a problem, or parents, call me, text me. 
and I'll have a mother call me and say, hi, Laura. So I, I, I took a picture of your slide two years ago at orientation and thought I'd never have to use it, but here I am. And so we'll have parents that will realize, oh my gosh, my student who was a fabulous student in high school, who had great grades and a great GPA, who I never had to worry about, all of a sudden they've, they've come to college and, and their wheels fell off. And so my office, part of my job is actually be um, very confidential in how I reach out to students. And, and, and again, I, I don't believe in equality of treating every single person the same. I believe in equity and treating everybody individually. And so depending on that student situation, you know, some parents will say, you can tell that student I called, and, and that'll actually help. Um, and other times a mom will say, hey, no, don't tell, you know, my daughter, her boyfriend, she's been dating for three years, just broke up with her. And as silly as that sounds, that, that was her world. And to, to an 18-year-old girl, that's a huge deal. That's their first heartbreak. And so all of a sudden, um, I'm not going to mention that to the daughter or to the navigator. I'll, I might tell the navigator about it, but I'll say, don't mention it. But let's give this student a little more attention. Let's make sure it's not impacting them. Because, again, once we see that, you know, usually when something big in your life happens, that there are ripple effects. And so we try to catch, okay, we're noticing this problem. And, and it usually it pops up in absences. It pops up in those progress grades. And again, those aren't the problems. It's the underlying problem. But I make sure that, that when, when parents call me, and they, again, they do call me on a regular basis, that we intervene and we try to find a solution for those students. Uh, and again, that's an individualized process every single time. Yeah, and that story you were telling me about was the key card. So uh. you can track students. <laughs> With their cards. And yes. Oh, I forget that one. Okay, yeah. So, um, you know, sometimes parents will call and be like, well, my child, you know, this is what they're doing. They'll give me a story. And, and I have the ability, you know, we're, we're in this technological association, you know, and we're, we, we can look at everything. And you have a, a key card. You know, my phone, I have my, I have my ID on the back of my key card. And that gets me into my building. That gets me into everywhere on campus. If you're a student, that gets you into your residence hall. That gets you into the Sanderson Center where we work out. If you go buy food, you're using that ID card, using it everywhere. And so then I can say, oh, actually, your student is having a great time. They're going everywhere. Or I've had other students where, listen, this student is never leaving their room. They literally leave their room two times a day. They, I can see it takes them seven minutes to walk across campus. They go to Chick-fil-A. They swipe at Chick-fil-A. Seven minutes later, they're back in their dorm, and they don't open their door the rest of the day. And so that, that gives me a, a strong indication there's a mental health problem, that when students stay in their room for too long and they aren't going to classes and they aren't going anywhere else. It's, it's one thing if a student is not going to class, but they're out having a good time. Um, I'm not saying that's okay either. <laughs> but we need to figure out kind of what's going on with the student and, and try to help fix those situations. And I've, I've had some very creative parents. I had a, a couple years ago, I had a, a student come in my office and he was kind of angry. He came and he's like, hey, I'm supposed to meet with this Miss Laura Dunn. And I said, oh, that's me. How can I help you? I'm supposed to come talk to you and talk about, like, time management or studies, to how to study. I don't know. I'm supposed to talk to you. And I was like, okay, come on in. And, and after about 10 minutes of talking, I realized, you know, he realized I'm not a miserable person. I'm actually really nice. And, and I realized he's not as miserable as he is coming off. He's actually a really nice kid. But he's just frustrated. And I said, well, what is making you mad right now? And he said, so my mom, she told me I had to come see you. And when I was like, no, she said, well, I changed the password on Netflix. <laughs> and so she won't give me the Netflix password until I meet with you. And as silly as that sounds, that was one of the best ideas I have ever heard. That, let's be honest, if a student wants to ignore me, if a student wants to ignore their navigator, they can but who's paying their cell phone bill? Who's paying their car note? Who, who has access to all of the money and all the stuff? It's your parents. And so parents have to have some back pocket items that they can pull away from students if they aren't doing what they need to do. Netflix. <laughs> a hot topic. Yeah. So I know you have a counseling background. So just for a moment, let's touch on mental health. Yeah. Do you have any tips you want to give maybe for parents um, to be aware of how do they how do they know if their students are having mental health problems or even students? Do you just want to speak to mental health? Yeah, so so mental health is something that I, I don't care how mentally stable a person is. I think every single person at some time in their life is going to need to speak. 
to a counselor or a therapist or someone in the mental health field that um, when you come to college, you're going to have a lot of different types of experiences. And, and some of the experiences, most of them will be really good. But, but what happens when your whole life you said, I'm going to be a vet, and all of a sudden you get here and you realize, man, biology is really hard. I don't think I can do this. And all of a sudden, that, that's what you've told everybody your whole life. Those students struggle internally with what they're going to do and how do they tell people. Um, it is 100% okay to ask for help and find those resources. Um, also, our society, not, not to say that mental health hasn't always been around because it has, but our society right now was kind of plagued with mental health because of, of technology. You know, I, I was a freshman in 2004. I'm 34 years old right now. And so when I was in college, that was right the verge of, of smartphones. I remember my, my junior year is the first iPhone that I saw. But my freshman year when I would go to class, you would sit down in a class. No one had a cell phone out they were playing with. Maybe they were playing Snake on an Okia, you know. But people were talking to each other. People were bored and they would lean over and say, man, this rain today, right? And all of a sudden you have a random conversation about the weather and all of a sudden you learn someone's name and all of a sudden you build a connection. Now, when students walk into a classroom, let's say you're a student and you don't know anybody. And again, I'm, I'm, I went to high school in South Mississippi, but I remember my first class I ever had at Mississippi State, it was a psychology course, had over 150 people in my class. I got in there and I was kind of overwhelmed in that moment. But nowadays when students walk into a classroom and they're overwhelmed or they're kind of scared, their first inclination is to, is to pick up their cell phone and, and text their mom or to, to scroll through their Instagram or, or a continuous Snapchat record they have going. And as wonderful and as comfortable as that makes you in that moment, all of a sudden you realize by doing that, you're, you're ignoring the connections you're supposed to be making. You, you aren't talking to the person next to you that can be a wonderful resource when all of a sudden you have a question about the notes or you have a question about, hey, you want to study together? You never made the time to meet that person and talk to that person. And so um, I, I've talked to students before and they say, yeah, but if I put my phone down, nobody else does. You have to be willing to be the first person sometimes. Yeah, that takes us back to the comfort zone. Yes. Not only is there no growth, but you're not going to have real relationships Unless you get away from that phone. The phone I, is oh the comfort man. zone. Oh, man. I'm sitting here. I'll hold my phone, but I had it over here. Um, but but that is, that's a real problem for students. That it, When I'm walking across our drill field on campus, we have this beautiful drill field. And during class change, we've got thousands of students walking right there. And don't get me wrong. There are wonderful conversations and people joking. But I would say about half of the people, like any other school, are just looking down at their phones. Or they've got headphones in, you know. If you go to the grocery store and you have headphones in, that's sending a message to every single person around you that I don't want to talk to you, I don't want to be bothered. And what kind of a society is that? You know, I, I, I am a communication major. I am a conversational person. I, I thrive on connections with people. Um, and so I, I make it, I, I teach a couple classes on campus. And so I have a, a kind of rule in my class. Listen, I'm not going to be crazy and say, if I see your cell phone points off, but keep it away, put it away, put it on silent. I don't want it to come out in class unless I tell you it can come out in class because we're doing an activity that, that involves your phone. Um, but, but, but mental health is something that um, it's absolutely a problem right now in our world, and it's not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, people have to be open about that. And I tell individuals that even if, even if you're not struggling with that self, keep a watch out for your friends. That, um, you know, my office only has so many people. When I think about the who's involved in student success, it's not just my office. It's everybody at the university. It's, it, it's, it's someone inside the cafeteria that says good morning and knows your name and checks up on you. It, it's your janitor inside of your residence hall that knows your name and talks to you. It's, it's your RA. It, it's that girl in your psychology class that you talk to every day or that, that friend in your sorority. Keep a watch out for your friends. And don't be afraid to, to reach out to them and say, hey, I noticed that you – you seem to be a little off lately. Is everything okay? And um, that can be an uncomfortable situation to be in. Sometimes that can be an uncomfortable conversation. But you never know what somebody might need. You never know the impact you can make on somebody. And so, again, um, making sure that if, if you need help or someone else needs help, that, that you get them that help they need. Yeah, that's good. Reminds me a little bit of uh, another show we did with Tyab. Um, you should check that one out if you haven't heard it. But he mentioned Give Hugs. And I had just recently read an article that it takes 12 hugs a day to really thrive. 12 hugs? 12 hugs, this article said. So I think it was like 
three hugs just to like be alive. <laughs> Maybe no, it's four hugs. Then eight hugs to maintain, and then twelve hugs. And I'm not a hugger. I'm not a hugger either. But <laughs> when you do hug, there really is this connection, this yeah. extra connection you get, and pa- and just a. Uh, the warm, fuzzy feelings, of course, but power from somebody else. I don't know. There really is something from that. But I'm hearing from you. It's so important to build a network Absolutely. of friends. And you've got to put down the phone. You have got to get out of your comfort zone um, to make that happen. Just kind of like a cocoon of people yeah. around you. And you may not feel like you need it right now, but you never know when you will. And you can't take the chance that you don't have someone. Absolutely. That's so good. Thank you for sharing that. Um. At North Star Academy, we have a student success coach, Mm -hmm. and she says one of the biggest problems we have with students getting behind in courses is they are perfectionist. They will not turn work in. They will wait and wait and do it over and over because they don't think it's perfect. So then they find themselves getting way behind. Is that a problem that y'all have here? Um, yes and no. Uh, If if there's a due date in class and you don't turn something in, you get a zero. So that's not going to work. That's not going to work. They've been doing it. And and that's. You know, uh, whether we're talking about North Star Academy or a private school or a public school, typically our K-12 system can be a little more lax with people, and that can be really good for some students. But there is this idea of, of being a perfectionist, and I can't turn it until it's completely done. Um, you have to be able to set aside time to make sure you can get it done on time, um, that, that you can't be like that. You know, you spoke about mental health a second ago. Um, there might be a student that's going to class every single day that has wonderful grades, like a 4.0, but they are driving themselves crazy, um, literally crazy. And so I don't ever want a student to, to be so panic-driven and so anxiety-driven that they put themselves in that kind of situation just because of their classes. Um, that you know, when I think about student success, that, that's a holistic view, that it's not just your grades, it's, it's also, you know, keeping in the idea of what does your mental health look like, do you have friends, are you happy, um, are, are, you, are you passionate about your major, are your finances okay, how is your family, there, there's this holistic view of, of what students, what, what encompasses student success. Yeah, so if you're in high school and having trouble with this, you need to start practicing turning it in absolutely right? absolutely college is a different level and whoever is grading your homework if you don't <laughs> turn it in on time then you should get a zero so <laughs> again it's, it's it's letting students fail um that, that's really important as well you, you need to if, if students don't do so because they're unwilling to turn things in because they want to be a perfectionist then give them a bad grade yeah yeah that's good so i know that you're really passionate about helping students um find money to make college work yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so so money and finances is one of the things that I'm really passionate about because higher education in the last 15 years has become enormously expensive no matter where you're talking about. And so when, when students and parents are looking for schools and, and looking for resources, it's really important that you, you, you find those resources. So, of course, the universities themselves are going to have potentially scholarships and, and there's financial aid you can look at as well. Um, know that most of those scholarships universities give out are based on your core GPA and your ACT or, a- or SAT, depending on what school or what they, what they, what they prefer. Um, that's what most of them are based on. But, but don't be afraid to also look at private scholarships. Uh, there are huge amounts of private scholarships across the country, across the world, that students can apply for. Um, I was never the kind of person that had an amazing ACT score, and so I was really involved in speech and debate when I was in high school, and so I got a little scholarship through that. I was really involved. Um, I'm Episcopal, and the Episcopal Diocese in Mississippi had a scholarship that I, I got that. Um, I was my, my dad went to Mississippi State, and I got an, an alumni scholarship. Um, little bitty things, those things add up. Um, once you're on campus as well, we have, we have scholarships for – um, in like the departments, a lot of the departmental and college scholarships, a lot of those are for upperclassmen. Um, definitely freshmen get the bulk of the scholarships because it rolls on with you for the next four years. But let's say a student came to Mississippi State that was kind of an average student in high school, but all of a sudden they, they came to school and they've really blossomed. They have become a, a pillar inside of that department. They're involved with this club. It's really impactful. They started this program. They're, they're a student that really gives back to the institution, they're a perfect candidate to receive one of those college or departmental scholarships. But, but, but money, um, you just have to ask about that. Um, now, what about dorms? I remember you telling me you could save money. <laughs> yes, and, and so uh, one of the best ways to save money is through where you decide to live on campus. And again, every campus is going to be different. At, at our university, we have three different types of residence halls. We have um, one residence hall, which is kind of our 
are best of the best. Um, they're really nice. They're like hotels. You have your own bathroom inside of those rooms, uh, but those are really expensive. Um, know that you can get a much less expensive residence hall on our campus. Um, and you know, if I was a freshman, I'd live in Hull Hall. It's the cheapest residence hall on campus. It's got the best mm -hmm. location. That means you can sleep an extra 10 minutes before you walk to class. Um, you're not going to be spending that much time in your room anyway. So, so where you live on campus can end up saving you thousands of dollars every year. Um, also, your meal plan. Most schools require that you purchase some kind of meal plan, and, and you can customize that. Most schools are gonna custom are gonna automatically enroll you in the most expensive meal plan, which is kind of an unlimited. You don't need that, and so feel free to to bump down a couple notches uh, and be smart about your meal plan. Yeah. And jobs, jobs on campus. We know about the navigator, so yeah. it's okay to come to come to Mississippi State and make a mistake because <laughs> that will qualify you to <laughs> be true. a navigator. Are there other jobs you oh, can get? Oh, tons and tons. Yeah, we basically um, any office on this entire campus is going to have student workers. Um, I had a job my entire four years of college in different places. You know, my first job, I, my parents told me, Laura, you spent too much money your first semester. You need to get a job. Okay. And I was one of those uh, one of those bulldog callers that I would call alumni and ask for money. I did that for a year. Uh, so please be nice to those people. <laughs> um, but that was a fun job, and I made decent money out of that, and, and it created a network of people for me. Uh, but then I ended up – I. I was a roadrunner on campus, so I gave tours. So I ended up getting a job inside of the admissions office, and I got paper cuts out the wazoo with all the paper transcripts. But I started wearing thimbles, and it got better. Uh, but I always had a job there. And then uh, my last year of college, I worked in the leadership programs. And so I was involved in the leadership programs, and I ended up getting a job there. And so there, there are jobs all over campus. We have a part-time job fair that we do on campus that a lot of departments come out. But, but honestly, walking around campus and getting to know people um, – we're just like the real world that if, if you know someone and you know, hey, so-and-so is graduating, hey, can you put in a good word with your boss? Hey, I know this freshman coming up. That can be a good in for you as well. So, again, building those connections, networking yeah. is really, really helpful in college. Yeah, and having a job, <laughs> and if you don't show up, that's kind of built-in security too. That's a way to make oh, really yeah. good friends and, and, that are and, uh, watching you. And we have plenty of students that have jobs on our campus, uh, but we have plenty of students that have jobs off campus as well. Um, and... I'm not going to say you shouldn't have a job off campus because if you need a job, you need a job. But one of the benefits of working on campus is that you do get a lot of free time. You know, a lot of times a student worker job is, hey, sit at this desk, and if someone walks in, ask them what they need, answer the phone when it rings. But, but generally speaking, most students around campus, they're sitting at a desk and they are doing homework. They're sitting at their desk and they're reading their chapters. And so um, if you're a, a student at the university who's working, uh, we understand that your number one priority is – um, is college, and so we want to make sure that our student workers are are doing well academically, um, and so those those college jobs are great. So I know you mentioned you have ADD, and you struggle with <laughs> dyslexia. Just wondering if you have any tips for anyone that might be listening in high school, and and what that looks like. Any tips to prepare you for college? Yeah, basically, you know, and, and there are a lot of students, you know, that that struggle with different disabilities, and there are different levels of those as well. But make sure that you are not scared to tell people about those, that you actually ask for help. Um, our student support services on campus, for instance, we, we service over 2,000 students on our campus. That's a huge chunk of our campus that have some type of disability. Some of those disabilities we can see, and a lot of those disabilities we cannot see. And so we'll have students come to us and be like, oh, you know, I took this medicine while I was in high school, but I'm in college now. I don't need to take it. And, oh, my gosh, don't do that. Don't. Don't decide to go off medication for the first time when you come to college. It's not going to be a good idea. If you do want to potentially get off that, have a discussion with your doctor, have a discussion with your parents about what that's going to look like, and do it on a gradual process as well. But, but don't ever be afraid to, to talk to people, to, to ask for help, to take accommodations. Um, you know, and, and, and your accommodation is going to be based on what your disability is and what you may need. So that may be that, oh, well, this teacher doesn't allow computers. Well, I've got dysgraphia, and writing is very difficult for me. And so, okay, well, you get a computer in that class. Or um, you need extra time for a test, and so you get to take your test in this location with an extra, uh, an extra 40 minutes. Don't ever be afraid to, to take those accommodations. Um, they, they are completely confidential. 
so many students have them. And we got, we got students on our campus that are in the Honors College that are taking them. I mean, it's, it's across the board. There's not just one type of student that, that has a disability. Um, you know, I've got, I've got one of my children, my middle son, Jude. Uh, Jude is an extremely gifted and smart little boy, but we noticed when he was in school, he was having difficulty with reading. And we were like, well, what's going on? He is so incredibly smart. Everybody tells us he's so inquisitive. He memorizes information. Well, he ended up being being diagnosed as, as dyslexic with, with and you know, um, 2E dyslexia, which is exceptional in both categories, exceptional in that you're gifted and exceptional in that you're dyslexic. And so exceptional, you know, those can hide each other. He's, he's too gifted sometimes, and that hides his, his problems. But his dyslexia also sometimes hides his giftedness. And so there, there are plenty of amazingly successful people across the world and in our history that have had these same kind of problems, but you have to be able to learn how to deal with them as well. Um, and so I encourage people as well while you're in college, yes, take those accommodations, but try to figure out how will you actually deal with this in the real world. When you graduate college and you have a real job, how are you going to work around certain problems? How are you going to be able to, um, to, to do a successful and good job at everything you're doing with these disabilities? Um, and you 100% can. They don't have to limit you. Good. I got to meet her husband, George, and her son, Jude, last night <laughs> at the women's basketball game. He was so cute. <laughs> Tilly really loved it. Um, so sports on the campus, George told me that women's basketball and the men's baseball are the top sports you want to go to. Lots of fun. Uh, yeah, so so we go to a lot of sports. So I'm not just going to limit those, uh, but but there are a lot of wonderful sports. We are a large SEC school, and so um, for us personally, we are a baseball family. Um February 14th is not just Valentine's Day this year. It is opening day at Duty Noble Field. And so I am excited. I'm getting a babysitter for my three-year-old so my husband and I can go to the game together. My boys will just run in the outfield somewhere. I don't know where they'll be. Uh, but but we're excited about that. Um, you know, athletics in general. And um, my, my 10-year-old, he's gotten really involved with our tennis programs on campus randomly. He takes tennis lessons on our campus um, from one of the assistant tennis coaches. And that's been a wonderful opportunity. He has a Another kind of coach that he works with on the side besides that main coach, and he's the student manager for the tennis team. And so when we go to tennis matches, he's excited that he knows the coaches, he knows the players. And so you get to have a really good individualized conversation, uh, get to know a lot of those athletes. Uh, Football games are always really fun, and we have a brand-new coach, Coach Leach as well, who likes pirates a whole lot. Uh, (laughs) But that's always a a fun kind of fanfare event. But even the smaller – the smaller – sports like volleyball and and soccer track and field those are all fun sports to go to um the only ones you have to actually pay for are are basketball baseball and football everything else is a free event to go to and they're all really fun last night we were at the women's basketball game and one way to make money is get good at shooting a student (laughs) a male student i don't know if they said his name but he was shooting a half course half court shot to win five thousand dollars and he Hit it. I can't believe he did it. Oh, yeah. it was so fun. The crowd just <laughs> erupted. Then they did a replay and erupted again. Yeah, oh, that was cool. That was great. But I met a lady today in a hotel um, that we were staying at, and she said, did you try the popcorn? The we pop- we didn't know. So she started telling us about all these flavors. So tell us about the popcorn and popcorn porium. The she pop- said. porium. Popporium. Popporium. Okay. I'm glad I'm knowledgeable Pop-porium. about this. So I live downtown, actually, in Starkville, and so I can actually walk to Popporium on a daily basis. Um There's, again, a difference in opinion of which one you like the most. I am partial to the wedding cake flavor. Um, But some people like the movie, like the movie theater flavor. But there's, and she'll put chocolate on them. Mm. I don't know everything about it, but I know that it's all like organic and it's, I don't know how many flavors. They probably have 25 flavors. We're going to have to stop by there before we go home. It's delicious. It's a tad pricey, but I think it's worth it. Awesome. Well, I said we because I'm down here um, not only to do a podcast, but my daughter is checking out Mississippi State, and uh, I'm actually an Ole Miss alumni, so I said, I will support you coming to Mississippi State, but I will not buy you a cowbell. Tell us about cowbells. Supposedly, all freshmen are supposed to receive a cowbell cowbell before they come? Uh, so, uh, so it's a tradition on our campus. Um, there's some rumors about how that originally started. The rumor is apparently way back when in Mississippi State history, we were playing our, our dreaded rival Ole Miss, and, <laughs> and we were losing. And at halftime, uh, our architecture building is right next to the stadium. That architecture building used to at one time be a barn. Uh, it's a really nice building, actually, but at one time it was a barn right there. And a cow apparently way back when wandered onto the field in the middle of that football game 
and we ended up coming back and winning that football game. And so they ended up thinking that the cow was like a, a some lucky charm, and they ended up bringing him back, but it was too difficult because, you know, cows are – gross <laughs> and and so they ended up bringing the cowbell instead and it became a tradition on our campus and it's a really fun it's really obnoxious if you're not one of our fans oh it is obnoxious it is but if you have one in your hand it's lovely it's wonderful and it's so much fun but yeah the, the tradition is that um that all new students should have a cowbell but you cannot buy it yourself that someone has to buy it for you and stephanie was like well i'm not gonna buy it i'm not gonna well, <laughs> can't you don't buy have it much. but someone does so whether it's a family friend or a grandparent or, or someone that they work and it's got to be decorated well, that she can decorate herself. Don't worry about that. Uh, but but it's really fun. We have a first star cowbell yell on campus. That's a really great activity for students to get to before uh, before sporting events. And so everybody brings their cowbell, and it's it's really fun. Yeah, that's fun. I might think about getting her one. <laughs> yeah. So we've had a great experience so far here, and I thank you so much yeah. for uh, being on the show and just giving us all this amazing um, information. So some of the main takeaways is drop your cell phone. Yep. Not literally, don't break it, but um, <laughs> stay off of it. Look around, see who's around you, initiate conversations, um, and really just get involved, whether it's a job or I know I saw the Baptist Student Union while we were driving by. I know there's all different organizations and clubs um, that you can be a part of, but parents, big takeaway for parents is let your students fail now while they're at home with you so you can guide them. Don't do everything for them. For them. Yep. Let them do their laundry. Let them cook a grilled cheese. <laughs> cook something. Your job is to help them become independent. Yep. Are some of the main takeaways. Is there anything else you want to leave our listeners with, parents and students? I guess if there's one last thing that we didn't really mention, I would say make sure your students start studying now. Um, one of the biggest things we, we notice is that students will come to our campus and say, hey, I don't know how to study. Um, because if, if you give them a study guide for every single test and they're able to just – memorize that information, turn around, they're not really learning anything. And so the idea of, of having math problems and working them out over and over and over again without looking at your notes, doing, doing flashcards, doing quizlets, actually remembering information and getting good at studying now, um, that's a really important thing as well. Yeah. But, but generally speaking, when it, when it comes to, to your students, again, every single student is different and, and the support every single student needs is, is different as well. And so make sure you have a good relationship with your child. You set clear expectations with them when they come to college, whichever college that may be. And I think you'll have a, a good experience. Yeah. And I remember when my first daughter went off to college, somebody gave me the advice, don't text them all the time. Nope. Don't call them. Let them um, call you. And actually, that was really good advice because my daughter actually calls me and texts me more. <laughs> so I think that encourages them to do it when you're not yeah. all around them. So that's some advice. That I have, but this has been awesome. So fun to get to know you. Thank you for all this wonderful advice and helpful information. If anybody wants to contact you, how should they do that? Um, so you can email me at l dunn d u n n at provost p r o v o s t dot m s state dot edu, or you can call me. Um, my office phone is six six two three two five three one eight one. Or my cell phone is six zero one five five zero two one three five. You can text. Text me or call me anytime. I respond. Wow. She is super committed. I told you she's super passionate about uh, students. It's on my business card. I can't no hide success. it. No success. Wow. All right. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much. You bet. No problem. I'm happy to be here. Mm -hmm.